Good evening. I'm Heather Hiscox, and this is The National. We got multiple casualties. This is a mass casualty situation here. Another deadly vehicle attack, this time in New York City. This was an act of terror and a particularly cowardly act of terror. Dans une tentative d'intimidation sans précédent. A Quebec politician's allegations of intimidation by anti-corruption police. We are in a situation that is both very serious and exceptional. Plus, there's really a seismic shift in the amount of sleep that a typical team gets. The downside of streaming instead of dreaming. New York is no stranger to terror. Tonight, once again, it is a city in mourning after an attack that is becoming all too familiar. Eight people were killed and more than a dozen injured when a man in a rented pickup truck plowed through cyclists and pedestrians on a busy bike path. It happened in lower Manhattan, along the West Side Highway, not far from the World Trade Center. At 3.05 p.m., the man entered the bike path at Houston Street. He drove south about 20 blocks, hitting multiple people along the way. At Chambers Street, the truck crashed into a school bus, injuring two adults and two children. Stephen D'Souza picks up the story from there. The mayor called it a cowardly act of terror, a popular bike path transformed into a scene of horror. At first, people thought someone had opened fire on a crowd. It happened out of nowhere. I was walking down the street, it was a normal day, and just out of nowhere, I hear, see people, I see people running and screaming, and then just multiple gunshots, one after another. Moments before, a man in a rental truck from Home Depot drove along the bike path, striking pedestrians, cyclists, even a school bus. Central, be advised, we have multiple people on the ground. Audio from police dispatch gives you a sense of the chaos at the scene. Yo, we got, we got multiple casualties. This is a mass casualty situation here. The suspect then got out of the truck, holding what police say were two fake guns. Witnesses and police sources say the suspect then shouted, Alu Akbar. Oh my God. Those shots people had heard, that was police shooting and injuring the suspect. When I look down, down to see where the truck went, I, I, I hear nine to ten gunshots, and that's when I dug out of the way, and all the police, you know, came running towards where I was, not knowing what's going on. They don't know what happened. Police credit an officer at the scene for getting the suspect into custody. Reports say he is a 29-year-old from Uzbekistan named Sofalo Saipov. Police say they believe this was the work of one man and that there was no wider plot. But just a few blocks away from the World Trade Center, officials say they know they're always a target and that there's always a constant threat. We know that this action was intended to break our spirit. But we also know New Yorkers are strong, New Yorkers are resilient, and our spirit will never be moved by an act of violence and an act meant to intimidate us. Now, New York is a city on alert tonight. There is a heightened police presence on bridges and tunnels as well as at uh, transit hubs and tourist sites like Times Square. The police say it's not because there is a current threat, but they say it's out of an abundance of caution. Heather. Steve, we know the suspect has had surgery and is in custody tonight. What more do we know about him? Law enforcement sources are saying that the suspect left a note in the truck where he pledged allegiance to ISIS, and that's part of the basis for saying that this is a terror attack. And they say that he had a license from Florida and that he spent time there as well as living in New Jersey more recently, that he came to the U.S. in 2010. So investigators now are going to be combing through his life as they are here at the scene to try to determine a motivation for this deadly attack. Stephen D'Souza, thank you very much in New York City. Tonight, and we're going to check in with you a little bit later. Now, for more on this, I'm joined by security analyst Phil Gursky, who is in Ottawa tonight. Phil, once again, here we are seeing a vehicle being used as a weapon to deadly effect on a busy city street. Are we looking now at an unpreventable kind of attack? 
I, I think, Heather, that uh, in the absence of any intelligence or information that the FBI or the NYPD or any other U.S. partner may have had of this individual, it is basically, uh, it is, it, you can't prevent this because you can't prevent people from driving cars down the street. So we'll find out in the, in the hours and days and weeks to come if, in fact, this person had, tri you know, tripped any wires, if he had come across the radar of the FBI or their agencies to see if they knew anything about him. And we're going to have to wait and find out. So right now, we're, it certainly looks like a terrorist attack. It looks like it was, at a minimum, perhaps Islamic State-inspired terrorist attack. But there's a lot more questions and answers at this point. We'll come back to, to that point, because we heard initially from officials that uh, there was no evidence to indicate a larger plot. But now we're hearing reports, Stephen just mentioning those, that there were notes indicating he'd pledged allegiance to ISIS. Where does that take us? Well, you know, it, it's way too early to tell if this person had any assistance from anybody in his milieu, his family, his friends, people he had met. What I find fascinating is that he came to the United States in 2010 from Uzbekistan, from Central Asia. That suggests to me, based on research that I've done, both at CSIS and, and now that I've been retired for a couple of years, is that he radicalized in the U.S. And we know that people don't radicalize on their own. They radicalize within environments. So my questions would be, who does he know? Who was he in contact with? Did he have any contact with Islamic State members, either in the United States or abroad? Had he traveled abroad at any point? So these are all questions that, that, that professionals will be asking and will be part of the investigation in the days and weeks to come. And they will be asking the suspect himself. We know tonight he has had surgery. It looks like he will survive. So how important is that to investigators, Phil, and how will that affect their next steps? Well, they'll certainly ask those questions of him. Whether or not he cooperates is another issue. But certainly, if he is willing to, to share any information with the FBI, with the NYPD, they'll, they'll get some answers to the questions that I already alluded to. So it all depends on what kind of shape he is in physically, what kind of wounds he suffered, whether or not there'll be a recovery period, and whether or not he wants to actually tell them anything. He may just uh, clam up and not say a thing. Phil Gursky, thank you very much. Phil's you, in Ottawa tonight. Now, back in this country, accusations of police harassment and intimidation have Quebec's legislature in an uproar. MNA Guy Wallet says his reputation is in tatters. He was arrested by the province's anti corruption squad last week. Now he is accusing it of orchestrating a setup. Alison Northcott explains. Guy Ouellette is a former high-profile Quebec police officer and a sitting independent member of the Quebec legislature, where today he made some stunning allegations. In an unprecedented attempt at intimidation, he said, I was the victim of a setup by the anti-corruption unit. Last week, Willette was arrested by Quebec's anti-corruption police known as UPAC, part of an investigation into leaked police documents. He was later released and has not been charged. Les faits qui me sont reprochés n'ont aucun fondement. He says the allegations against him are baseless and suggested UPAC is trying to prevent elected officials from doing their work. J'affirme donc qu'il m'est intolérable. Ouellette has support from his political colleagues. House Speaker Jacques Chagnon called the arrest intolerable. He said police should either charge Ouellette with a crime or apologize. <laughs> Quebec Premier Philippe Couillard called on UPAC to provide answers. It's not trivial. We haven't seen this very often. I invite you to look back in history. An elected parliamentarian being, being, being arrested without any true motive being, being given. I don't remember, recall say, seeing this before. Willett was head of a committee studying a bill that would give UPAC more powers. In an interview in the Journal de Montréal yesterday, a former government analyst alleged Willett was arrested because he was about to reveal potentially damaging allegations that the anti-corruption unit itself was involved in a collusion scheme. This afternoon, UPAC denied the allegations it's facing and defended its investigation into an internal leak and Willett's arrest. Je suis convaincu UPAC Commissioner Robert Lafreniere says he's convinced someone will be arrested in this case and says the investigation is ongoing. Still, many questions remain. Opposition parties say the government needs to do more to get clear answers in what some have called an unprecedented crisis at the National Assembly. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Coming up, let the countdown begin. 100 days until the Winter Games, we talk to Olympic host Scott Russell in South Korea. Plus, an exclusive interview with the family of the Russian man who inspired Canada's Magnitsky Law.
It's a good way for me to honor his memory to be present here today. The White House was still trying hard to change the channel today, away from the investigation, indictments and arrests into Russian meddling in the U.S. election. You guys seem completely obsessed with this while there are a lot of other things happening around the country. The president himself was focused on it, though. Donald Trump wouldn't answer reporters' questions, but he did tweet that fake news is working overtime. Two of his former campaign aides were charged yesterday, and a former advisor pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. Washington wasn't the only capital preoccupied with the fallout from the Russia investigation. As you can imagine, it dominated the conversation in Moscow, too. Chris Brown has that side of the story. The charges in the Russia investigation are big news here in Moscow, and they're also dominating a lot of the political conversation coming out of the Kremlin. That being said, the line, really, the talking points have not changed really since this whole issue of Russian interference in the U.S. election in 2016 began. And today it was the same. No smoking gun, nothing that directly connects anyone with the Kremlin to anything that happened uh, in the United States. We heard from Vladimir Putin's chief spokesperson today, Dmitry Peskov. He called these allegations groundless, and he accused people in the United States of fostering Russophobic hysteria. The Kremlin's line has long been that the U.S. needs someone to blame for its failings, and Russia is an easy target. On the widely watched television shows here, programs such as 60 Minutes gave extensive coverage to the charges against uh, Paul Manafort and Rick Gates. Interestingly, much less to the plea agreement involving George Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos's plea agreement clearly discusses how Russia's foreign ministry reached out to him because of his role on the Trump campaign. Foreign affairs officials were asked about that today, but they had nothing more to say. Some of the more independent-minded Russian media were more cautious and totally dismissing uh, these latest charges, saying things are at a very early stage, more details could emerge, and there could yet be details come out that are damaging to Russia. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Catalonia's president finally spoke today from Belgium. Carlos Puigdemont promises to respect the results of Spain's snap regional elections in December. Puigdemont is facing charges of rebellion, sedition and misuse of public funds. He says he'll only return if he can be guaranteed a fair trial. A Spanish judge could issue a warrant for his arrest later this week. The final report on British Columbia's multi-billion dollar hydroelectric project is due for release tomorrow. It looks at the viability of the controversial Site C dam and will force the province to decide whether to proceed, pause or terminate the project. Site C would be the third dam on the Peace River and would flood an 83-kilometer stretch of the valley. That area includes sacred indigenous land as well as farms. Greg Rasmussen spoke to one landowner facing the prospect of losing her land. One day this will either be an electricity producing hydro dam or simply abandoned. Nothing but a two billion dollar hole in the ground. How much of a connection do you have to this, this property and the buildings on it? A really, really close connection to all these buildings. On this one room schoolhouse is on Arlene buildings. Boone's family farm. Most of her property has now been expropriated and will be underwater if the project is completed. Tomorrow's report caps a 40-year fight. It, it's going to be a tough one because it'll, you know, it's going to probably determine the future of where we go or where we, we don't go. So it's, um, it's another stage in our life that's going to be either a, a step forward or many steps backwards. Boone says it would actually save British Columbia money to halt construction and walk away. If I drop $10 down the toilet hole, <laughs> um, you know, I'd leave it there, you know, because it's not worth going after. You cut your losses and you move on. When construction began, it was expected to cost $8 billion. The latest estimates say that could climb to up to $12.5 billion. Cancelling it now would cost at least $3 billion. Earlier expert reviews questioned both the need for the power and the cost. So how big a deal would it be to actually cancel Site C? 
would be massive. It would be huge. There are fears killing the project would lead to layoffs and boarded up houses. I believe that if they do cancel the project, I won't be able to sustain the amount of employees that I now have that we've hired on because of the project and the extra work. Um, I, it just makes me very sad because it is going to really hurt us. This project was started by a B.C. Liberal government, but its fate will be decided by the NDP elected earlier this year. It now has a tough choice, spend billions more to complete the project and flood the valley, or kill it and simply walk away after spending billions. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Fort St. John, B.C. Poor sleep is becoming an epidemic for teens. More than a third are heading off to school on less than seven hours of shut-eye. It's putting a strain on their health, grades, and parents. As Vicodopia reports, the culprit is just a click away. <laughs> We're both like, Resistance yeah. is futile. Whether you're a real estate agent like Amanda Ricks or her 15-year-old daughter, online communication seems to yeah. never stop. And when I was like ready to go to bed, I'd like put it on the floor, and then I'd get a text, and then I'd pick it up again and like do that kind of routine. And that routine comes at a price. By the time she got home from school, she was exhausted. So by 3 o'clock, when you want to curl up and have a nap, that's a good sign that she's not getting enough sleep. What is enough? Nine hours, usually. But a lot of Rhea Ricks' friends are spending some of that time on their phones. People at school like, tell me that they went to bed at like 3 in the morning or something. I'm like, how? New data analysis from the U.S. suggests stories like this aren't just anecdotes. Texting and streaming are cutting into dreaming. 40% of American teens surveyed now sleep fewer than seven hours a night. There's really a seismic shift in the amount of sleep that a typical teen gets between 2009 and 2015, such that if you think of raw numbers, million and a half more teens are not getting enough sleep relative to just seven years ago. When the smartphone race launched a decade ago, there was no telling how it would change our behavior, especially in teens. I would say sleep deprivation is an, is an epidemic among adolescents. This particular study... This New Brunswick psychiatrist says inadequate sleep can damage how young people learn, and the consequences can go even deeper. Your ability to um, enjoy yourself, um, to be free of anxiety and uh, depression uh, is certainly impaired. Experts say it's up to parents to limit their kids' phone use. Not always easy. The one thing that's really hard is being a mother to a teen who's constantly on her phone because it's something that I've never experienced. And I can't call my mom and find out how she dealt with it with me. I don't have... It's, it's the first time for all of us. Until she figures that out, both mom and daughter now follow a simple rule. Keep the phones out of the bedroom. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Just 100 sleeps until the Winter Olympics begin. Is South Korea ready? That's next on The National. This flame is a symbol of peace, unity and friendship. And we hope that all this will prevail and will pass the messages to the rest of the world. The Olympic flame arrived in South Korea today. There was the scene as it was handed over to Pyeongchang organizers. In 100 days, that torch will be the center of attention as it arrives in the main stadium for the opening ceremony. In the days that follow, the world will hold its collective breath in hopes of a peaceful and safe games. Pyeongchang is located in a quiet region of rolling hills and popular ski resorts. It's also just 80 kilometers from the demilitarized zone that divides the Korean Peninsula and the threat that lies to the north. As Kim Jong-un trades insults with Donald Trump, tests nuclear weapons and sends missiles into the Pacific, the world watches and worries. A number of countries have raised concerns over the safety of their athletes. South Korea has dismissed the North's threat as an exaggeration, even as it takes extra security measures, including setting up a crack cyber defense team and doubling the number of troops. We consider it our top priority to ensure the safety and security of each and every 
national team. One open question, will North Korea send a full team of athletes? Their presence would add to the safety and security, officials believe, so the IOC has pledged to cover all costs to encourage them to compete. In our fragile world, that seems to be drifting apart. The Olympic Games have the power to unite humanity in all its diversity. Just as the flame arrives in South Korea, so does our Scott Russell, who once again will be the primetime host for CBC's Olympic coverage. He joins me now from Seoul. It's great to see you, Scott. Let's pick up on what I was just talking about there. The North Korean threat is obviously the number one issue right now for these games. Are you there seeing any obvious security presence now? Well, Heather, as you mentioned uh, in that piece about security, uh, Pyeongchang, 80 kilometers away from the North Korean border, it's uh, a heavily security uh, type of border. Um, and yes, some countries have expressed concerns, France, Germany, Austria. Uh, but the IOC just last week in Geneva gave its full blessing to the games. Uh, but we're going to see increased security. Uh, just to get into this ceremony, when the flame arrives from uh, Greece today, uh, we had to itemize by serial number every piece of equipment that we brought onto the tarmac uh, of this airport. Uh, and also, we were submitted to a full body search. So that's something that we're going to have to get used to. Uh, the South Korean officials have said there's no question. With regard to these games, the security will be tight, maybe the tightest we've ever seen. Obviously, all sorts of media there for the start of the torch relay, Scott. And as you know, it's such an important moment for the host country. It really helps create the buzz. So what's your read on the atmosphere? atmosphere there 100 days out. Do you know what, Heather? Uh, South Korea has waited for these winter games a long time. Pyeongchang lost in bidding for the 2010 games to Vancouver very narrowly, to Sochi for the 2014 games very narrowly. They want to become a winter sports nation. Uh, the legacy of the 1988 Summer Olympics here in Seoul is still very strong. We visited the Olympic Park yesterday. There's a great reverence for the Olympic Games and the part that the Olympics played in South South Korea's emergence internationally. So yes, there is a buzz about these Olympic Winter Games, and they're very much hoping that the Games will make South Korea a winter sport powerhouse. The first person who will take that flame, ignite the little cauldron here at the airport, and begin the torch relay is the Olympic champion figure skater Yuna Kim. She's considered a national treasure here. Uh, she's immensely popular, and I think the Games are going to be immensely popular in this country. Well, we've certainly been hearing a lot from officials about how all the facilities and all the venues are set already. Are there any concerns about readiness, Scott? You know, Heather, we talk about this before every Olympic Games, and we saw the results of it in Rio. Uh, we, we saw it in Athens in 2004. That's one area where there isn't much of a concern. The venues are up and ready to go in both the mountain and coastal clusters. They're very close together. Uh, they've been tested out. Uh, many world championships have been held there. Uh, the Canadian luge athletes are here right now training uh, on the sliding track. It's all ready to go. They're beautiful venues, with the exception of curling. They're brand new uh, and as I said uh, the construction is all complete and here's the other thing there's a high-speed rail line which will connect the capital of Seoul uh, to the Pyeongchang region it will take an hour and a half to get there uh, that train is already built it's been tested and it will be fully online by the beginning of December no concerns right now about readiness Good news there, Scott. Okay, you mentioned luge. Let's talk more about sports. We know Canada had such a strong performance in Sochi in 2014. How's the team shaping up this time? I think the team has very high hopes based on world championship results last season. Canada's right near the top. They're going to send about 240 athletes. That will be the biggest contingent to a winter games outside of Canada. Um, they won 25 medals in Sochi, 10 of them gold. Uh, there are four new sports coming to these games. Snowboarding, big air, uh, mixed doubles, curling, team alpine, and mass sports start speed skating. Canadians are all at the top in all four of those sports. 
returning veterans, Tessa Virtue, Scott Moyer in the ice dance, Alex Harvey, the great cross-country skier, Mark McMorris in snowboarding, the hockey teams, both men's and women's in the curling. Uh, Canada's got a tremendous upside at these games, Heather. They could surpass 25 medals. Okay, so that sounds exciting, but you mentioned hockey, and that is really the big disappointment for many. There will be no NHL players in these Olympic Games. So what does that mean for Olympic hockey? I think it's disappointing to many that the National Hockey League players will not be here. Uh, that said, there will be full hockey tournaments for both the men and the women at these Olympic Games. Uh, Russia has the advantage on the men's side. Uh, many of their players who currently play in the KHL, their professional league, uh, will give them an advantage because they're playing at a high level. The Canadians are going to have to rely on uh, perhaps uh, players playing in Europe and also some junior players, some minor pros. So that will be a bit of a difficulty but there'll be a fuller emphasis on women's hockey at these games and hey Heather you put anybody in a Canadian uniform they're going to cheer for them <laughs> at the Olympic Games and we the hockey players give them great reason to cheer Scott thank you so much for tonight we will see you again from there in February our Scott Russell Calgary may be one step closer to hosting the 2026 Winter Olympics. The committee exploring the feasibility of a bid handed its report into City Council today. A decision is expected next year. Up next, a special thank you to Canada. Can you show us what you've done? Sure. Why this widow and her son are in Ottawa this week. That's next on The National. I'm very proud of what my father did. I respect him quite a lot for his actions and uh, the fact that he stood up to corruption. He was a Russian lawyer and whistleblower. Sergei Magnitsky paid the ultimate price for exposing corruption in his country. Eight years after his death, he continues to inspire change, even in Canada. Magnitsky exposed a multi-million dollar tax fraud linked to the Kremlin. He was jailed and beaten to death by prison guards. His killing sparked an international campaign for legislation targeting corrupt foreign officials, barring them and freezing their assets. Earlier this month, Canada became the fourth country to adopt a Magnitsky law. And this week, his widow and son are in Ottawa. They sat down with Diana Swain for an exclusive interview. Natalia, let me start with you. What is your reaction to this law being passed in Canada? Um, I would like to thank everybody who took part in creation of this law. We are very happy that it bears the name of uh, Sergei Magnitsky and it will be uh, always in the memories of the people. I also would like to highlight that this law has a global character and it's aimed into fighting corruption in all countries. Nikita, why was it important to you to come here? I'm very proud of what my father did. I respect him quite a lot for his actions and uh, the fact that he stood up to corruption and uh, injustices and I think it's a good way for me to honor his memory to be present here today. What do you remember of him because you were so young when he yeah. died? Uh, yeah I was fairly young so I guess I didn't get to know him as much as I would like to know him. I remember that he was a person who always kind of followed a certain set of ideals that he had and uh, he would always um, sort of stand up for what he thinks. Uh, we would sometimes argue. and um, Even at that age? Yeah, a bit, but, you know, it, w it wasn't like a debate. It was more of a uh, kind of friendly discussion, I guess. Natalia, you mentioned that this is, it's a global effort to deal with human rights abuses. But initially, even this government was reluctant to pass the act. There was concern at some levels that there was another way of dealing with Russia, with human rights concerns, that they didn't want to agitate I mean, Vladimir Putin. Uh, what would you say to countries that are frightened about passing a Magnitsky Act because of that? 
Я думаю, что... Well, I think I already mentioned that it's a global law, and I think that priority tasks of any government is to fight corruption around the world. And it's uh, fighting the corruption and to uh, defend uh, uh, people's rights. I think we will be able to fight this problem when all the countries will unite in this uh, war. Nikita, this, this law in Canada and elsewhere doesn't just bear your father's name, it bears your name. When you hear it, what does it sound like to you? What does it mean to you? I think it just makes me really proud of my father, and I have to highlight the fact that they're his deeds and people should remember him for what he did. And um, he should be the primary association with this law. But also, the law should be associated with all the people in the world who, world who are facing corruption and who are facing uh, human rights violations. And I think that's the most important thing, because that's kind of what has the most effect on the modern world. Natalia, you, you left Russia because the Russian government didn't seem to be done with your family. After the death of uh, Sergei, we wanted the appropriate investigation, a fair investigation, into the death of Sergei Magnitsky. Many facts were not uh, evaluated on the legal grounds, and uh, we decided to leave Russia. Whenever people talk about the Magnitsky Act, they invariably talk about how your father died and all of the things that led up to it. And I wonder if, at the same time that you're proud of the fact that this act has been passed and what it talks about and what it says about your father's actions, if it isn't also difficult for you to keep hearing the details of his death. Uh, honestly, just the, his memory, uh, my memories of him, and uh, my pride for him, it honestly overwhelms those kinds of feelings. I, th I only remember him for the best things that he's done, and I think I've come to cope with the kind of grief. And the reality of it? Yeah. I want to ask your mom, I, so I just asked Nikita to talk about how difficult it is to, to constantly hear about the details of um, his father, your husband's death. As a mom, how do you manage that? How do you manage both raising your son, keeping him safe, keeping him secure and happy with knowing that this is always a presence in your lives? It's understandable that it is, it is still very hard for us to remember the details and the whole tragedy around it. I would like to say that Nikita is the one who supports me the most, and he is a grown-up young man, and he is assisting me in keeping myself together and not to break down entirely. Nikita, I mean, at 12 years old, you're in Washington translating for your mom as she's talking to John McCain, who was one of the leading voices in getting this act passed in the United States. At 16, you're sitting here talking to me and, and the rest of Canadians about what has to be, on some level, a very difficult topic. Tell me what it, it's like for you to try to manage that with just being a 16-year-old. You know, I never really thought of that. and. Um it's kind of an interesting question because I think everyone faces a lot of difficulty in their lives regardless of where they're from and who they are. Everyone has their own burdens and uh, difficulties. But I feel like if I you know, wasn't able to do this, I wouldn't really be able to be with myself because I have to do something for my father after he's done so much for all of us. Quite apart from the person that we see sitting in front of me now, you know, the other part of your life is that you're an artist and you can express yourself through art. And I understand that's part of what you want to do when you meet with the Prime Minister. Can you show us what you've done? Sure. And so what is important about this to share with him? I think this is just kind of a show of gratitude for him and uh, Honestly, I just wanted to bring something that would that he could appreciate 
as an artwork. And um, yeah. And important to you to share that yeah, with him. That definitely. sounds, it's it a personal the, expression of you. Yeah, it was one of the first pieces that I did when I just started learning. So it kind of holds a bit of importance to me, but I'm really happy that he can have it. My last question for you, Natalia, is do you hope that there comes a time when talking about Sergei is something that exists simply within your family, that it doesn't need to be a public conversation? Do you look forward to that? Wow. I never thought about this question. It just happens. Oh. It, it happens. And we always remember Sergei. I always think, how would Sergei do in certain situations? And I try to do the way he would do and deal with it the way he would deal with this. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Up next, the power and the problems of crowdfunding for the classroom. A BC teacher has tapped into the power of crowdfunding to boost the learning experience in his classroom. The initiative is putting new tools in the hands of young students, but critics say it's a slippery slope. They worry private money in public schools will lead to unequal resources and uneven learning. Good morning, everyone. So, a few months ago, I applied for a grant in hopes of getting some devices that we can use to explore math and science, art and technology. And something great happened. We won. What do we have here? Congratulations. We have some surprises from my class needs. So it's red, look on there. My name's Curtis Weeb. I'm a grade six, seven teacher here at Crescent Park Elementary in Surrey, BC. I'm not one to kind of teach out of the textbook. And uh, so I really enjoy when we have devices uh, like this. That's the one, go allow and go plus. For me, when I um, see them learning and taking things apart and understanding how things work, that's, uh, that's real learning. <laughs> Yeah, it's a square. <laughs> you did it! Okay. Curtis Weeb applied for a classroom grant through a Toronto-based registered charity called My Class Needs. His $1,000 worth of robotics equipment was hand-delivered to his classroom by the charity's development officer, Nicole Beatty. My Class Needs is a young charity. We're heading into our fifth year of operations. Um, in that time, we have been able to support teachers like Curtis um, over 8,000 times. You know, we've raised close to $2 million to support classrooms in needs. Hi, Amy. We're doing some VR. <laughs> My Class Needs was launched in 2012 by former public school teacher Amy Kupal. We saw that there was an increasing need on the part of teachers to bridge the gap between the vision that they had in their classrooms for their students and the resources that they needed. It operates a crowdfunding platform connecting public school K-12 teachers with donors interested in contributing to their classroom projects. The charity also raises money through partnerships with corporations like RBC, Best Buy, TELUS, and Chevron. Kupal says My Class Needs acts as the buffer between the classrooms and the companies. Our role is really to work with the teachers who have those amazing project ideas and to take that corporate funding and apply it to the projects that the teachers have so that when their project gets funded, what they get is a box of whatever they've asked for at their school and the focus is really on the teachers and the students in their learning. So that's where we really come in as being the intermediary matching those funds with those classroom projects. It's the thin edge of the wedge of privatization. There's no other way to put it. 
But bringing corporate money into classrooms in this way is troubling for critics like former B.C. Provincial Parent Advisory Council leader and public health expert Farah Shroff. Once we start seeking private funding for what should be completely 100% publicly funded, we move down the slippery slope. Shroff says this fundraising model takes responsibility off governments to fund public schools properly. So when a teacher very uh, passionately says, my children need more resources in this classroom, and so I'm going to take the resources from wherever those resources come, they're making a pragmatic decision to be able to do their job better. In the longer term and in the bigger picture, those kinds of decisions slowly lead us to make very dangerous decisions about our education. My Class Needs biggest impact so far has been in British Columbia. According to the latest Available Statistics Canada numbers, BC ranks lowest in Canada in terms of funding per student. So when My Class Needs and Chevron began a four-year STEM-focused Fuel Your School program in 2013, it was a hit. It raised $1.8 million for BC schools and made My Class Needs a go-to for thousands of teachers. But for BC's teachers' union, targeting individual teachers and classrooms in this way doesn't solve funding gaps. If you have a company um, saying, you know, hey, we'll fund your classroom, um, make your best pitch, and we'll help you out. And, and, and then that's done. But that's one classroom in one school around the province. And, uh, you know, hooray for those students and for that teacher who desperately needs the tools to do their jobs. But we also have all the other classrooms and schools around the province um, that desperately also need modern equipment, well-staffed schools, um, qualified certified teachers in all of them, making sure that there's fine arts opportunities, uh, tech ed equipment that's modern and workable. The Chevron My Class Needs partnership re-energized the debate over how teachers like Curtis Weeb should be getting their classroom needs met. Vancouver School Board rejected the funding, but the Surrey Board, BC's largest, embraced it. Our board's approach is, is that why close that door? Uh, there are people and there are businesses, entities, enterprises that want to support public education. And the, our board believes that's a good thing. My Class Needs only approves classroom projects that meet school board regulations, which include a ban on any funding that comes with branding or logos in the classroom. As long as that's the case, for Surrey School Board and others in B.C., bringing in corporate funding is a logical and pragmatic decision. Now, if, if, if the argument is that uh, the, the provincial government uh, should fund all of that, that's great. Um, let's do that. That's something for society to decide uh, how much they want to put into education, as it is with health care, highways, and the whole bit. The funding for core curriculum is, is there, and uh, if we have people from the community saying, we want to support education, uh, can we do that? I, I don't know any entity that would say, we don't want your resources, we don't want your support. If you like music, you can program it. For teachers like Curtis Weeb, who have realized their classroom ambitions because of my class needs, the debate is one for policymakers. I'm always looking for, for help and how I can differentiate the learning in my classroom. Um, and if there, I don't need to have any corporate banners up, awesome. And um, I don't think we should have, uh, you know, it, Let's just keep the learning what it is and keep the devices um, where they need to be in the hands of students. I'm coding the little dash guide. It's very high tech. I enjoy it a lot. It's teaching me how to do different things on coding, like for them to turn like at a 90 degree angle or for them to look a certain way. You just learn new things and it's really awesome. 
at the end of the day, you're going to do what you have to do as a teacher to get the resources, to get to make sure that there's time, that there's attention, and that there's really great learning taking place in your classroom. And I think that's what every teacher strives for. No matter what policies are in place, what regulations are in place, you're going to do what is best for your classroom and for your kids. Clark Kent made an appearance today in Ottawa, joined by some very spooky friends. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was joined by Sophie Grégoire Trudeau as Diana Prince and Ella Grace as Wonder Woman. Hadrian was Sky from Paw Patrol and Xavier a werewolf. They visited the Governor General along with other trick-or-treaters. Straight ahead, we'll go back to New York City for an update on our top story. That is one World Trade Center in New York, lit up red, white, and blue tonight at the governor's request in the name of freedom and democracy and to honor the victims of today's attacks. Stephen D'Souza joins me once again from the scene. What's the latest, Steve? We're just about a block away from uh, One World Trade Center, and the president has been tweeting about this incident tonight, calling the suspect sick and deranged and saying that he's asked Homeland Security to increase the extreme vetting program. But it should be mentioned that Uzbekistan, where the 29-year-old suspect Saifullo Saipov is from, is not on that list of countries that have travel bans from the United States. And so we're getting a more... A uh, rounded picture of the suspect tonight, uh, learning that he came in 2010 to the United States, spent some time in Florida as well as New Jersey. And one report says that he rented that truck from Home Depot only about an hour before the rampage began here on the West Side Highway. And as we hear more from friends and colleagues, uh, he was apparently a commercial truck driver uh, up and down the U.S. So. We're hoping to hear more details about him. We do know that he is still in hospital tonight, underwent surgery. He was shot in the abdomen by police, and they are expecting to speak with him. And so a greater picture is going to emerge. And to answer that question that so many people here are asking why this happened, I was speaking with uh, a resident in this area, which has become quite a residential area in the last few years, says this is just re-traumatizing people in New York who lived through 9-11. Heather. Stephen D'Souza in New York, thank you very much for the reporting tonight. And that is The National for this Tuesday night. For the latest on the attack in New York City and for news at any hour, you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Heather Hiscox. Thank you for watching.